All right, everybody, welcome back to We Play Games. I'm Walker, and here we are finally with our Form Traits video on our Age of Wonders 4 multiplayer basic series. Now, this video is geared towards multiplayer, but that said, you absolutely can take this and apply it to single player. It's just that generally in multiplayer, a big part of the game is that you have to do auto battles against the AI. Manual battles are generally reserved for PvP. And that means that, of course, the things that you have to evaluate and the way you have to evaluate things is, is pretty different. You can't rely on just cheesing the, uh, the AI in a manual battle and getting any build to work the way that you can in, in some single player scenarios. Some of these traits obviously are like role player centered, but I think that broadly speaking, the change that they made in the Empire and Ashes slash Golem update is huge and very healthy and very well done. So for those of you who don't know, prior to the, uh, the Golem patch slash Empire and Ashes DLC, we used to have the mind and body traits. I did do a video on that a little while back, uh, but but some of those traits were a lot better than the other ones, and ultimately there were really only a couple that you could justify bringing in a multiplayer scenario. That is not the case anymore. Now that we have this five trait point system, and a lot of these traits that were a little weaker have been reduced down to only one, and some of these very strong ones are up to three, there's a lot of really interesting uh, deltas when it comes to the different traits that you can bring in, in Age of Wonders 4. Now that said, I think we should have a brief conversation about our grading system, as well as, of course, like what these traits actually do, because they're not going to be useful in absolutely every single scenario. And so contextualizing that before we jump in, I think is going to be useful. So where do these traits actually apply? These traits are actually only gonna apply to units and heroes of your race. Generally speaking, you're always gonna have some evolutionary units in multiplayer very early on, so these traits are not going to apply to those. Evolutionary summons are a, a very different kind of beast than your own racial units. And you're also probably going to go ahead and find a free city to hire a hero off of. A very, very common pattern in multiplayer these days is to just delay your earliest hero until you find a free city because if you find a free city with zero opinion of you then you can hire a level three hero a level three hero is obviously a lot more combat efficient than a level one hero so you won't have to deal with any sort of losses there hopefully uh, you know no guarantees when it comes to auto battles and and multiplayer and the like but ultimately you should be aware that these traits are going to be really influential on your early game creep because these are going to be applying to the the troops that you have at the beginning of of the game, and then they're going to become slightly less and less important throughout, but they'll always be there as long as you're using some racial units like Eagle Riders or Warbreeds and the like. And so the way that you want to evaluate them is one, what does it give me up front? Two, how does it scale throughout the game? And that's gonna be impacted here on our tier list. I think that the S and the A tiers are gonna be those that really you can't go wrong with. We'll talk about good use cases for everything, even the ones that I feel like uh, probably a little bit underperform. But the S and the A tiers are gonna be those that really, if you're not sure where to start, start there. The B and the C tiers are gonna be those that are still useful, but ultimately have very particular niche cases or ultimately are just like kind of carbon copies or the S and A tiers, but weaker. Maybe they have a serious problem where there's just like a broken mechanic and hopefully something gets fixed by, by Triumph in the future. And then the D tiers are going to be those that I personally have either experienced and played around with and know are not good, or just haven't seen anyone actually use them usefully in a multiplayer scenario. That doesn't mean that you can't take them in single player. Like, you know, obviously the game is about having fun, but if you're trying to rumble in multiplayer, player, you should be aware that if you're taking a D tier, either you're a genius like Morgi or Amikdara and know exactly how to get good value out of these things, or you're uh, trying not to play super hard, which is, you know, that's also fine too. Now that said, instead of just going through, you know, and, and looking at all of the one point things and then, you know, talking about all of the adaptations all at once, I think it's going to be more fun for us to just follow this little list down here for our, our tier list. I'll put a link for this in the description and uh, we'll evaluate things alphabetically. And that said, we get to start with our big uh, big loser in our, our new update, Adaptable. How the mighty have fallen. So once upon a time, Adaptable was like one of the best traits in the game. It used to be plus 30% experience on all of your racial units, including your heroes. This is huge when it comes to multiplayer, because if you can get to level four or eight earlier with your heroes and get some uh, good signature skills on them, then it makes it a lot easier for you to just, you know, click on a, a bronze ancient wonder and click auto battle or a silver and auto battle it and, and not worry about losing things because signature skills really 
do make a big difference even in auto battle, but this isn't applying to your heroes anymore. Um, it is only one point, which is nice for adaptable, but getting extra experience on your non-hero units isn't nearly as useful as you'd expect. The early game units that you have access to, your tier 1s and tier 2s, only get a couple of extra hit points when they level up. Now of course this is going to be applying to all of your racial units, including you know your war breeds and your eagle riders and the like, but ultimately you probably have other ways to scale those units that are better if you're going to be using those things. Getting racial transformations is actually very very strong, and 20% experience points really just doesn't do as much as you'd hope. I think unfortunately adaptable, even with the nice little use case of, of feudal being able to evo evolve their uh, uh, their pi pikemen into defenders faster just isn't very good and part of that of course is a reflection on feudal itself but ultimately I think that this trait is not that great I think you can do a lot better than adaptable and I think that if somebody wants to beat me with this and move this up to a C tier then I'd be happy to but I think the way that it stands now is you probably can just skip adaptable and, and find better one point traits here because there, there are some really banging one pointers all right so up next we have arcane focus this appears to be a fairly innocuous trait, something where you're like, alright, if I'm using battle mages, as it says here, uh, you'll just get extra damage and it only costs you two trait points. So this might lead you into thinking that if you're playing as mystics or whatever, that you should be taking arcane focus every time. But that's not really true and it does misunderstand the way battle mages work. Now obviously, battle mages in particular with mystics, because of the existence of arcanists, they do get a little more out of this pick. But most battle mages are not actually going to be the main source of damage for your army but rather a supporting unit that assists offensively. Now, some of the other support units also do the same thing where they're going to be giving you strengthened or the like, but these guys are going to be, rather than buffing your own units, they're going to be debuffing enemy units, and that's a really big part of, of what the value of a battle mage is. Some of them, like uh, the spellbreakers, are enormously, enormously powerful, not because of the magic damage that they do, but because of their ability to remove buffs from enemies. Others, like the, uh, the awakeners and their ability to add distracted once they've been awakened or even earlier on in the game if you're playing on a team format and you want to take white witches and the like for all of these you're not really using the battle mages to kill enemy units you're using the battle mages as crowd control or as a way to increase the dps for your other units so that means that like arcane focus is kind of a non-bow or at least not necessary in order to get maximum value out of your battle mages you don't want to be overloading on battle mages and just show up with no front line because then you'll, you will absolutely die as, as melee units just slaughter you wholesale. And so you have to use these very particularly. Now, fortunately, it's not just battle mages. Obviously, with the introduction of the item forge, you can create insanely powerful magical attack items for your heroes. And that makes that ultimately you can have a, a wizard hero a little better now than you could earlier. But that's, of course, stressed against the fact that now we also have access to the, uh, the pistol and sword, which is ridiculously good and probably needs to be nerfed in the future, but there's another good use case for this. You know, arcane focus is magical attacks, and this does apply to your dragon ruler. So if you really want to go into it, you can make your dragon ruler's breath weapon insanely powerful using arcane focus. I think that's probably the best use case of arcane focus, in my opinion, but I think that because it doesn't really work on the thing that you're intended to be using it on, or at least it's not necessary for the thing that that you should be using it on, battle mages, and the fact that even if you are trying to make like the beefiest dragon in the universe, this doesn't really increase their survivability, just their offensive output, and ultimately when it comes to Age of Wonders 4 uh, and the way that the morale system works, you do want some offensive output, but you really don't want to be losing units. I think that arcane focus isn't great. There are some use cases. I think it's generally better than adaptable because it does have that nice synergy if you're just trying to play on a very, very small map and kill people with mystics and Tome of the Horde on like turn 15 or whatever, that you can use it. But I, I think that Arcane Focus does not deserve higher than a C tier, unfortunately. All right, so up next we have our first adaptation trait, Arctic Adaptation. Now, Arctic Adaptation, I'm, I'm happy is the uh, the first one here because I think that nowadays it's actually probably one of the strongest adaptation traits. But the adaptation traits all do something unique. They all change the starting terrain around your capital. As it says here, starts in the Arctic. So this means something very particular. It means that 
that A, you're going to be starting with snow or ice near you, so if you take the uh, Tome of Cryomancy, your SPI will be guaranteed to get you a lot more mana than otherwise. It also gives you access to the Freeze the Land spell. Now, all of these terraforming spells are ridiculously expensive. You're basically never going to cast them in a multiplayer scenario. I'm not sure why they cost so much, but they cost 60 mana and 60 casting points. When it comes to early game in Age of Wonders 4, you are not wasting 60 mana in order to, you know, get 3 extra mana per turn. That means you need 20 turns with an SPI in place in order to just make back the mana cost. And that's overlooking, of course, the fact that 60 casting points in the early game is an extra evolutionary summon that you could have access to. You're mostly not going to be casting these terraforming spells. Even if they were like 20 mana and 45 casting points, I still wouldn't be casting them that often in multiplayer. And the way they are now, you're basically ignoring them every single time. Now that said, they do still have some good use cases because of the SPI overlap and because of your ability to control control what spawns near you. That's actually, I think, the biggest thing that you get out of all of these traits. But you also get a nice little niche bonus. Um, if you look in the Age of Wonders 4 database and you look in our nature tomes, you actually see on the Tome of Beasts itself, Summon Wild Animal. So Summon Wild Animal is not actually an entirely random pick. It gives you access to a very particular group of things, depending on what environment you're casting it on. And in this case, I think if you want to get the most out of Summon Wild animal, you actually might want to consider taking Arctic Adaptation because you get a 13% chance on an Ice Spider. Ice Spiders, of course, are tier 2 evolutionary units that evolve into tier 4s. That is really, really strong, as well as access to Polar Bears, which are really nice tier 2 units. I think these guys generally perform better than the uh, the Razorbacks that you get on just default. And overall, getting access to Gortusk Piglets is also really nice because Gortusk Matriarchs in the event that they evolve are really terrifying. Their ability to eat corpses mean they're, they're a lot more durable than you'd think otherwise. So ultimately, Arctic Adaptation, I think, is like the most usable out of all of the adaptation traits. But because Freeze the Land is just like unnecessarily expensive, the ability to build farms is mostly skippable. In the early game, you really want to focus on getting academies down in your cities as quickly as possible. And then maybe you start picking up farms. And by then, hopefully your city is big enough that it can reach out of snow and then like who cares if there's farms or not these are are very niche mostly role playing but they do they do have some use cases just be aware that the biggest use case i think for arctic adaptation is the control of what you're fighting against if you take Tome of Pyromancy and Arctic Adaptation, then you'll actually be very impressed at how easily your uh, your heroes with just the fire skill just mulch through the uh, the creeps and, and clear the board very, very quickly. And I think that means that the Arctic Adaptation is probably a C, maybe a little bit higher than Arcane, just because this does give you an economic bonus indirectly through your ability to either get extra mana from an SPI if you take Cryomancy, or just kill stuff if you take Pyromancy. All right, so up next we have Athletics, our first three-point trait, and boy, howdy, this is an important one. So when it comes to Age of Wonders 4 in the early game, you're not just taking your entire stack and sending it into a fight, hopefully in, in multiplayer. The ideal way is to break off, you know, one of these sacrificial units that you don't really care about, a Dawn Defender or a Warrior or a Sender or whatever, and send it into a resource node on its own. Then you also have within the reinforcement range, you have your heroes and your evolutionary summons. That way you preserve the movement points on the important units. If your unit that you send off into, you know, Leroy Jenkins things dies, that's okay. But in the meantime, your other units who've preserved their movement points might be able to move into another fight. If they took damage, they might be able to move back into friendly territory to heal. And that means that anything that gives you extra movement points gives you indirectly extra economy. It gives you extra experience points for the important units and extra military strength that way. And it's just great across the board. Not to mention, of course, like extra movement points on Mystic Projections is really critical for Mystic in in terms of their ability to keep exploring the, the map, just because of the way the uh, the mystic pickup thing works, you really do want to consider athletics with, I think, basically everything, because it, it doesn't just stop in terms of value early game and in comparison to the mounts, but it actually continues into the mid and late game. Because one of the things that's going to become more and more apparent the more multiplayer you play is that there are a lot of things that do extra damage to large targets, and all of the mounted things make all of your optional cavalry into large targets. They give 
give them a little bit of extra hit points to, to compensate, but five extra hit points when your opponent is doing, you know, 40% extra damage or 70% extra damage is not enough to compensate. And athletics just undercuts that problem entirely by keeping your heroes or your critically important uh, early game or even mid game units as small targets. This is a really great, really, really great pick. The only downside of course, is that it doesn't really give you anything on the units that are naturally mounted the same way that these guys do. But across the board, I think if you're not sure what you should be doing to get extra movement points on your units and not sure how to build things, take athletics. It also performs really, really well with stuff like war breeds, or if you want your hero to have access to a, a pole arm, then you kind of have to take athletics. You can get around it in combat through access to a, a haste spell, but the eight extra movement points on the world map is enormous when it comes to repositioning prior to access to teleporters. It really is a, just a gigantic deal. And I think for that reason, I think athletics probably does need to get an S tier. I, there are obviously some mounts that are going to be able to compete with us, so we might end up as like a low S tier, but holy mackerel, movement points are good. Three cost on traits doesn't make this any worse. All right, so up next we have Bulwark. Bulwark says defense mode grants plus two defense and plus two resistance. That is, of course, on top of the natural plus two defense and plus two resistance you get from being in defense mode itself. Now, these numbers should sound pretty familiar. If you've looked at resistant as well as tough, then you see that each of those traits will in turn give you plus two resistance or plus two uh, defense naturally. But this puts both of them together with the caveat that you have to be in defense mode in order to get those bonuses. That means that in order to get good value out of Bulwark, you need to either be uninteresting in combat and just like defending a lot and ultimately just getting overrun by your opponents, or finding ways to enter into defense mode proactively. Fortunately for Bulwark, there are some really good ways to enter into defense mode proactively available from the very beginning of the game, and even scaling into the mid game. It used to be in the late game that you could just rely on Bastions and defensive mastery and Bulwark to just like carry the day and have immortal Bastions when it came to late game fights. That's no longer the case and I think is generally healthy, but there are some really, really strong ways to enter into defense mode available no matter what. If you're playing as Industrious, the taunt on your Anvil Guard puts you into defense mode. If you're playing as a uh, Barbarian, the stun from your Shield Bash also puts you into defense mode, but available to everyone through two different tier two tomes, you have some really nice ways to get into defense mode just on the board. If you have Glades and Aspect of the Root, then your all of your pole arms as well as shields can actually heal themselves and then enter into defense mode, which of course is proactively changing the nature of the board. But one of the biggest changes that makes Bulwark actually very good here is the Tome of the Construct. Whether or not you can actually take Tome of the Construct does kind of depend on your build, but Tome of the Construct in particular gives you access to Cascading Command Defend. Largely, I'm not a big fan of things that require you to clump your units together. I think overall, if you're clumping your units too much, your opponents are going to get AoE ways to exploit that, but Cascading Command, Defend, and Reposition are both very, very powerful spells when it comes to the game, and this one allows all of your Linked Mind units and constructs to enter into defense mode, even if they've already acted. So this is, I think, like the best use case for Bulwark is to, to take this tome right here, but if you're able to actually affect the board state while also entering into defense mode, this is a fantastic skill, and I think one of the things that people are still kind of sleeping on when it comes to Age of Wonders 4. This this is, I think, an A tier. Maybe it's a low A tier. We'll see how we, we end up slotting things out, but overall, you cannot go wrong taking uh, Bulwark. All right, so up next we have Cold-Blooded. This is another one of those traits that has very little text, but quite a lot of subtext. So for one point, you get morale loss being reduced by 50%. It says that units are less likely to route, but that's not really the, the be-all end-all when it comes to morale. Now be aware, if you've watched some of my streams with, you know, Winslay and our group, that routing does come up, but that's not the, the only point of morale. Routing is at 60 morale, but very low and low morale both inflict a fumble chance on your units, and for that matter, high morale allows you to inflict extra crits, which in turn also inflict morale damage because of the way critical actually works. And so what this means is that this 
trait can be very, very strong under very, very particular circumstances. It's not good when you're just clearing, you know, resource nodes. If you have four units, two of them are heroes or whatever, and the AI has just like four random dudes standing around guarding a, a gold mine, morale is not going to matter in that fight. And in fact, as you scale up towards the end game, morale is going to matter less and less because you're going to start hitting things that have fearless or things that have morale bonuses for all of your units. Uh, scalds are really good, but anything that prevents your units from routing is going to be incredibly powerful. So this means that Cold-Blooded has a very, very narrow band of the game where it's actually pretty nice. It's very, very, very good in like a big team fight on like turn 20 with a bunch of tier one and tier two units, because there you're getting an enormous bonus before people are actually able to do morale manipulation. The only downside, of course, is that because it's not useful at the very beginning of the game, not very useful at the very end of the game, this is a, a very crowded play space for cold-blooded. But if you're playing on the skirmish mod by Badok, which I, I'm not sure if he's still updating it right now because he's a little burned out on, on Age of Wonders 4, but hopefully he gets back to it. But there on the, the skirmish mod, especially if you're playing like 18 versus 18 with low tier units, you should seriously consider cold-blooded. That said, I think that cold-blooded is probably just a C. Um, it does have some, some nice use cases when it comes to different forms of PvP, but be aware that this thing can be a lot stronger depending on your map. All right, so up next we have defensive tactics. How do we rate defensive tactics? Well, this gives you plus one defense, plus one resistance, and plus 10% evasion when standing next to a friendly unit with defensive tactics. It does not stack. So what this really means is that this isn't a, a, an ability that requires you to deathball your units. In fact, you definitely shouldn't be deathballing your units even if you have those sorts of abilities, but rather this one allows you to move your units in pairs, and those pairs will cover each other pretty effectively. Plus one defense, plus one resistance, and plus 10% evasion might not sound as impressive as like plus two defense and plus two resistance on Bulwark, but while this one has very particular builds that do exploit it really well and, and do utilize it really well, this one opens up the battlefield for you a lot. You don't have to do much in order to get great value out of the defensive tactics. The biggest problem that I can lever against it is that A, evasion isn't as useful as you'd think. Most people are still not using a bunch of ranged units in multiplayer especially because they just do not perform well in, in auto resolves. That's a problem that I, I hope that Triumph uh, revisits in the future, but largely defensive tactics also doesn't give you status resistance. And as we mentioned when talking about Arcane, uh, I think that a lot of battle mages really aren't being used for their damage output, but rather for their CC and their debuffs. And so the fact that defensive tactics doesn't give you a status resistance bonus is actually like a lot worse than this, this evasion bonus. I think the defensive tactics does have some really nice uses, especially in a smaller map where you can you can do some real fighting very early on in the game, because 10% evasion matters more if you're just fighting against people with their basic army than if they've been able to build up to war breeds. But like defensive tactics, this this does do what it says on the box. As long as you just keep your units in pairs, then this can be a, a meaningful upgrade over something like tough or resistant. And I think for that matter, I think we probably can go ahead and give this like a low B tier. We'll we'll fill things in as we go, but just just don't don't death ball them and this will perform pretty well. All right, so up next we have Desert Adaptation, the weird younger brother of Arctic Adaptation. So Desert Adaptation, what do we get? We get a desert around our capital. Unfortunately for Desert Adaptation, there is a little less predictability whenever it comes to the units that you're going to be fighting instead of Arctic Adaptation. And unlike Arctic Adaptation, where we did highlight the good value that you could get out of your uh, Tome of Beasts and Summoning Wild Animals, the pool of things that you summon from if you start with Desert Adaptation is really bad. I just not not a big fan of Inferno Puppies or Inferno Hounds. I think largely tier one and tier two units aren't great. And the fact that these guys evolve into tier twos rather than tier threes or tier fours is a really big ding against the uh, trying to use Tome of Beasts with that, that adaptation. So what can you use Desert Adaptation for? Well, it does give you ways to exploit frost weaknesses. So if you take the frost staff on your, your ruler at the beginning of the game and the ability to use that uh, freeze spell, then that can be pretty good. And of course, if you take Cryomancy, it, your SPI won't be generating extra mana for you, but that's okay. It doesn't have to generate extra mana to be good value. A research post is a research post is a research post. But Desert Adaptation does give you something 
something interesting in the, the mid game. So we did highlight that, you know, this uh, Tome of Beasts is just not very friendly towards uh, deserts. But on the other hand, the Tome of Vigor is incredibly friendly towards deserts. So you can see here, uh, cold, you can summon an Ice Spider Matriarch a, a tier four. That can be pretty good. And White Wolves and Thunderbirds. This is all like a pretty nice selection of things. But if you start with Desert Adaptation and you don't die, then you get up to 50% chance to summon a Phoenix on your, your summon greater animal. Summoning Phoenixes is, I think, the best use case for Desert Adaptation. Summoning a 50% chance on a Phoenix is really, really disgusting. So if you end up with like three or four of them, very quickly you can overwhelm your opponent because phoenixes just they play really really well until your opponent gets a way to eat corpses but that's a way down the line and unfortunately because it's such a slow start i think desert adaptation just isn't very good if you can get to the mid to late game and and then you know get into toma vigor then it can be very powerful but that you can just move towards deserts if that's what you want to do the map is big conquer towards a desert that's generally better than starting with desert adaptation adaptation, unfortunately, so we do have to give them a D. All right, so up next we have our first of our mounts, Dire Bear Mounts. Now, Dire Bear Mounts are restricted to Empire and Ashes only. If you don't have the DLC, you won't see this here. But if you don't have the DLC, you're not missing out. Like, there are other mounts available to you. I'm not going to talk too much about the movement bonuses, because that is something that we talked about a lot when we talked about athletics, but rather I'm going to focus on each of the mounts and, like, what they make available to you in turn and the best use cases for them. So Dire Bear Mounts give you 10 hit points, whereas the other ones only give you five. Hit points, I think, are one of those things that you, on the surface, you might think you want more of them on your glass cannons, and there's an aspect to that that is true, but ultimately, if you have, like, a high damage, low hit point unit, you do want to just keep those out of combat, or, you know, out of frontline combat as much as possible. That's the best way to have more hit points, is just don't get hit. Um, but that's not always an option if you have, like, melee stuff. And that's what Dire Bear Mounts, I think, really, really perform well with. In particular, I think Dire Bear Mounts perform really, really well with power attackers because of this unit deals 40% damage against units in defense mode. So heavy charge strikes on things like Tyrant Knights and Dark Knights and uh, regular Knights, they naturally want to be attacking into units that are in defense mode because they break the defense mode and allow other people to follow up with attacks. And in this case, because defense mode naturally gives a pretty meaningful bonus to defense, especially if they happen to have Bulwark, you're going to be doing less damage on that first hit. And Overwhelm really gets around that. In fact, it makes it so that against most things, you'll actually be doing more damage by attacking someone who has defense mode than someone who doesn't. That's kind of weird, and it does mean that like you do need to be careful about how you manipulate your combat. But I think overall, Dire Bear Mounts are fantastic on Knights in particular, and they're pretty good on other things. Like, you know, you're, you're going to get a little bit of extra damage in the early game by having Dire Bear Mounted uh, Dawn Defenders because the AI just likes to be in defense mode and if you have more movement speed you'll be able to get that first hit for a little bit of extra damage but the big bonus the really big bonus for Dire Bear Mounts is the the knight combo and of course you do have a uh, ruler starts with Dire Bear Mounts so if you have a Dire Bear and you have an AoE magical attack and you have arcane focus going on or something like that you can do some proactive damaging on, on defensive mode at a big, big range, but I don't want you to be like attacking into defense mode with your Glade Runners on a Dire Bear mount. That's like generally not great and not the best application of, of a mount in general. I think that these guys do focus in on, on heavy charge strikes. If you're going to have units with heavy charge strikes, you probably want Dire Bear mounts. That's probably like an A tier. You know, they, they perform really well in, in a particular build and they don't perform badly in other ones. You're going to get extra hit points no matter what you do, but the best way to get value out of this is to use Overwhelm, and that means that you, you kind of want ways to get your units into melee and doing lots of extra damage in one big hit, and that says Heavy Charge Strike to me. All right, so up next we have Dread Spider Mounts. Now, Dread Spider Mounts, unlike some of the other mounts here, we don't get a passive ability, and unfortunately, unlike Unicorns, who still have a very powerful option here in phase, the Dread Spider Mount web ability has just gotten nerfed over and over and over again, so now we need to evaluate Dread Spider Mounts as they stand and they don't stand very well. So web, it used to be bugged. It used to do double damage, and I'm glad it doesn't do that anymore. Uh, but now it's a two hex cone right in front of you as, a, as a, basically a melee attack. That wouldn't necessarily 
be a problem except for the way that it checks for accuracy. The way it checks for accuracy is it checks against the first target, and if it misses the first target, it won't even check for accuracy on any of the other ones. I think that's a bug, and I think that it's something that probably needs to be fixed by Triumph because it makes Dread Spiders like really anemic, uh, even in early game fights. We had a, a little game with Winslaya and Zombie where I had a spider and I attacked with a web into a lesser storm spirit with only a 40% chance because of the wind barrier, but that was like the only thing I could attack against. And then it missed everything else and then prompted a retaliation attack from the, the lesser storm spirit anyway. It's just not where you want to be when it comes to your mount traits. And unfortunately, because of the fact that this is a physical damage thing, it's not going to scale particularly well into the mid to late game. Generally, people are going to have more hit points to the point where you probably aren't even going to be clicking web, even if you have access to it most of the time on like turn 40. So the use cases for this are pretty narrow. It's really good in the very beginning of the game still. It does do a pretty good job of making your Dawn Defenders a lot more dangerous in auto resolves, for instance. But Immobilized is just not as good as you'd hope. Uh, it doesn't prevent people from doing retaliation attacks. It doesn't prevent them from being able to shoot you or use different different non-movement abilities to, to keep in the fight. And the best use case you might think is like, all right, if I've played Reavers, Subdued does work with Immobilized. So like, maybe you want to take Dread Spiders on your Reavers. The issue therein is that Subdued is actually like actively not good for Reavers. You, it, when you subdue a unit, you don't get the experience points for killing them, which means that if you are subduing things, you're really undercutting the growth of your heroes. Uh, so I think Dread Spider mounts, you can still bring them if you want. Um, and I do think that this, this option here would be better if it were able to check for accuracy against all of the units. But the way that it works now, I think I, I can only recommend this based off of the movement points alone. Now the movement points alone, I think are not bad, but I think that this is actually meaningfully worse than defensive tactics and probably meaningfully worse than a lot of the other things we'll see in the B tier. All right, so up next we have Elusive. Now, what do we get out of this? It's a one point trait, so that means it's really inexpensive. It's easy to jam on basically any build, but unfortunately it's also not very good. Uh, it gets you plus four defense and resistance against retaliation attacks and opportunity attacks. That's not the worst thing in the world. Like, a, a, that's a lot of extra defense and resistance, but ultimately when it comes to like fighting against another human, uh, especially after like turn 30 or whatever, you should have enough things that do heavy charge strikes or charge strikes that like you're not gonna have a lot of retaliation attacks being thrown around anyway. And then your opportunity attacks, like mostly you're not gonna be taking those anyway either because you'll have sprint on your heroes or you'll have the ability to like phase your, your battle mages out if you took the uh, Tome of Teleportation or you just kill things that are threatening to cause opportunity attacks, right? You, you should have enough melee things to support your ranged units if you're desiring to bring them that you can avoid opportunity attacks entirely. So what is the real use case for Elusive? Well, in the beginning of the game, when you're auto-resolving against the AI, it does actually do a pretty good job of keeping units alive, mostly just because the, the AI just like runs units into each other and then they smash, 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 and then somebody dies. And hey, if you're taking a lot less damage when you hit them than they are when they hit you, that can do a lot when it comes to, to keeping your units floating. But I think that overall, the package that you get out of Elusive is like only that good uh, in like the first 10 or 15 turns when you're auto-resolving. And then mostly just doesn't do anything when you're in, in like the big important manual battles against the other people. And I think that you'll see that this also applies to single player as well. Like most of the time, you, if you're manual battling in single player, you, you just shouldn't be taking retaliation attacks or opportunity attacks. So uh, Elusive, unfortunately, despite being really inexpensive, I think is a D tier trait, probably better than Adaptable, but because it does not offer you like Phoenixes, I think we're gonna put it less than a Desert Adaptation here. All right, so up next we have Fast Recuperation, probably one of the weakest traits in the game right now. Fast Recuperation costs two points, which is just like a ridiculous amount for an ability that does literally nothing in combat, right? Regenerating an additional 10 hit points per world map turn does not impact a combat at all. It impacts your strategic layer in that it allows your heroes to heal a little bit faster and your racial units to heal a little bit faster, but ultimately you should be accomplishing that not through fast recuperation, but just through utilizing outposts. Any friendly terrain that you can put down not only is going to make it so your units can move faster internally, but they'll also heal just way, way faster inside of friendly terrain to the point where fast recuperation kind of is unnecessary. I think if this thing gave you like some sort of natural healing in combat, maybe a small one or an activated ability or something like that, it could be neat. But the way that it stands now for two trait points, you get uh, sort of a, a friendly terrain following you everywhere is just not very useful.
useful and not very impactful. So unfortunately, where it stands now, fast recuperation, this is an easy D tier. I think this might even be worse than adaptable, honestly, because at least this thing scales pretty well into the mid to late game and, and keeps your, you know, war breeds growing their experience points pretty quickly, whereas this eh, it just doesn't do anything. All right, so up next we have Ferocious. Now, Ferocious is sort of like the weird older brother of Elusive here. It's going to deal 40% extra damage via retaliation attacks and opportunity attacks, as opposed to having extra defense against those things. Uh, but unfortunately, it costs two trait points, and we didn't even like Elusive that much. Elusive is also like kind of an offensive ability in the sense that, you know, extra defense and resistance against retaliation means that you want to be proactively attacking people. People, whereas like Ferocious is sort of a defensive measure instead. It's something that gives you extra damage if people are attacking you. And so you might be inclined to want to bring Ferocious with something with a taunt effect, right? If you have like an Anvil Guard and you have Ferocious and you use a taunt on something, then you will actually do a little bit of extra damage in the early game. And there are a lot of industrious ways to get extra uh, retaliation attacks, more watchful. But ultimately the damage output of a lot of those units, because they are multi-hits are actually going to be pretty low and so if you want to do more damage via retaliation attacks like just enchant them or you know take strong or whatever and so what this really does more damage with is if you have a, a single hit like a, a power attack or heavy charge strikes that said you're not going to be doing a lot of retaliation attacks with those units anyway because they are a little glassier so they're not going to have as many opportunities to like hit back before one unit or the other is dead uh, and because this thing costs two trait points I really just can't justify bringing this almost any time like I, there are some really interesting things you can do with the item forge because now you can give taunt to your heroes and that can be cute that can definitely be a way to to get good value there especially if you take the the watchful trait on your ruler but just overall if you're taking a trait for like a couple of heroes and absolutely none of the rest of your army for two points you're, you're probably not going to do very well so unfortunately ferocious it's in the same boat as all these other ones just like not not a good, not a good trait. All right, so up next we have one of the most cost-effective traits in the game. Hardy. So if you haven't played with Hardy, it's one trait point for eight extra hit points. Now that eight extra hit points is a flat amount, therefore it's not going to be like a percentage-based scaling thing, it's not going to play as well into the medium late game, but it is very, very impactful in the early game, and it still is one of those things that the more defense and resistance you have, the more hit points you kind of want because of effective hit point multiplication. Eight extra hit points for one trait point compares very favorably to the mounted traits, right? These are five extra hit points for three, or or 10 extra hit points for three if you take Dire Bear. Uh, but even in comparison to stuff like Tough and Resistant, at the very, very beginning of the game, Hardy scales very well against that, and it's because of a couple of different things. So first, damage over time has been changed. Now damage over time checks for specific resistances to stuff. So here we can see on Poisonous uh, that there's a poisoned ability. This is going to deal Blight damage. That Blight damage actually ignores natural resistance on units. It would actually only check against blight resistance on units. That means that having a larger hit point pool makes you more resilient against damage over time effects. But it also just makes you more resilient across the board. On a percentage basis, it's actually like more efficient to have a uh, hardy than to have either tough or resistant in a vacuum when your hit points are very, very low. But even if your hit points are like 55 here, we can compare this, right? If we had 55 hit points and instead we had 63 because we took hardy, that those Sunderers would have functionally 14.5% more hit points. If instead we took something like tough or resistant, how many extra hit points would we actually have? So we naturally have a 10% physical resistance or a 10% magical resistance. Each of those will give us two extra on those damage channels, right? So defense at three instead resists 27% of incoming physical damage or 27% of incoming magical damage. That means that you're really only getting 17% extra resistance by taking tough as opposed to the like 14.5% resistance you're getting by taking hardy. Uh, and of course, hardy, as we mentioned, applies to everything as opposed to those specific damage channel picks. So while it might not be as effective if you know exactly who you're fighting against, like if you know you're fighting against uh, a mystic, for instance, then resistance will do more. But like here in a vacuum, if you're not sure what you're playing against, or if you're just interested in clearing 
you know your creeps as quickly and efficiently as possible party is fantastic i think that this is just a, a really really great ability if you haven't played around with it i strongly recommend it it does drop off a little bit into the mid to late game but be aware that natural regeneration checks off of your actual maximum hit point total so hardy on your war breeds for instance or if you manage to find a ring of regeneration anything like that it's going to work really well and of course just if you have 120 hit points instead of 112 and you have like 10 defense and resistance those extra eight hit points are going to go a long way because you do start hitting diminishing returns as your defense gets higher and higher it's a little harder to show that in the database but ultimately you start hitting some like soft caps when it comes to defense and resistance and then the, the hard cap at 20 and then you just like as many hit points as possible will really help you out but yeah, Hardy, this is an easy S tier. If you, if you haven't used it, you should. All right, up next we have Hideous Stench, which is my uh, nickname in high school. So Hideous Stench, what do we get? Adjacent enemies without this trait suffer minus two resistance and minus two status resistance. I'm a really big fan of anything you can do to manipulate status resistance in Age of Wonders 4, just because of how incredibly powerful some of the statuses are in the game. There are things like Frozen and Stunned that effectively like pseudo kill enemy units, and that's a really, really big deal. So anything you can do to make your enemy units uh, more weak to that is actually a, a very nice pick up here. And of course, minus two resistance, if you recall what we just talked about when it came to Hardy and like effective hit points on, on units. If you did this on an enemy barbarian, for instance, it would be plus 17% extra damage effectively, which means that this kind of does more damage against enemy units than stuff like Arcane Focus. But unfortunately for Hideous Stench, A, it costs three trade points. That is an enormous investment. I think this would be a lot more fair if it were only two, but meaningfully, this also requires you to be adjacent to the enemy. So it doesn't really do anything in the very beginning of a battle when your units are on one side of the board and the enemies are on the other. In order to get maximum value out of Hideous Stench, you need to have a primarily melee focused build, or at least something that can put a lot of melee onto the board adjacent to the enemies, and then something that can help exploit the magical damage extra that you're, you're doing here with your resistance. Now that does mean that this extra magical damage might come from something like Primal Strike on a Barbarian, 8 extra Blight damage that you get extra damage from because you have this minus 2 resistance, can be really really impactful, but you also kind of want to have like melee stuff that also does magical damage, so like a dragon with the, the cone breath attack for instance, can actually use Hideous Stench pretty well, but this is very, very narrow when it comes to the actual impact of the game, right? You, you need to have a lot of very, very specialized units in order to, to use this well, and I do not think that it, because of that narrowness, justifies the three trait points. I think this is cute, and I think that it's not, like, a truly unplayable thing on like some of the other traits that we've looked at but I think in order for this thing to be any higher than a C tier I think it probably needs to be only two trait points but overall like it's it's not strictly unplayable. Alright so up next we have Keen Sighted. Now this is a really interesting one simply because of the way auto resolve works. In multiplayer you're going to do a lot of auto resolve against the AI it's very very standard. I think that even in single player that one of the most fun ways I have to play the game is to do auto resolve only challenges because the the manual battle AI remains pretty easily exploited, and it's because of some of the behaviors that it, ex it exemplifies here. So if you ever used a ranged unit in an auto-resolve situation and gotten weird results and then gone back and watched it, you'll know what I'm talking about. The AI likes to take ranged units and like move them in towards melee units to take shots against them. The reasoning behind that is that the further away the ranged unit is from the melee unit, it'll have lower accuracy. So the, the logic of the AI will say, hey, we're going to do more damage damage if we get closer without thinking that, oh, if we're a ranged unit and we get super close to a melee unit, we're uh, gonna get thrashed pretty easily. And that's something that, like, I think the AI probably should just be improved on when it comes to behaviors here in Age of Wonders 4. But a way that you can get around this is to increase the accuracy on your ranged units. The higher the accuracy is on the ranged unit, the more the, the AI logic will say, hey, I don't need to get, you know, three tiles away from that, that unit to shoot at it. I can stay at five or six because I'm still going to have a pretty good chance at hitting it. So if you're trying to use ranged units, especially in auto-resolve, you should seriously consider Keen Sighted. The problem therein is that this is taking a bad unit type in an auto-resolve situation and making it sort of like medium. The best way to get around accuracy is to just have a Spring Fairy with True Strike. That's, that's the best way to use ranged units. It's just that that only lasts for one turn and you're not always guaranteed to get a Fairy, so, you know, Keen Sighted might be necessary. But the thing is, is that, like, phasing 
despite being nerfed, isn't like unplayable anymore. And that means that you're still having issues where ranged units are fragile, easily overwhelmed once melee units get there. And because mobility is still so high in Age of Wonders 4 in combat, you really can't over specialize in ranged units or you're gonna die. So keen sighted, it's, it's not that it's bad, it's just that it mostly applies to bad unit types and makes them like mediocre. Um, whereas there's some things that you can do like taking strong that makes good unit types even better or like tough or resistant or hardy that makes all of your unit types better. And that means that like this is still existing in a, a, a world where it's not ideal. It does have some nice use cases, especially when it comes to your magical attacks, like uh, the tier five tome astral, it allows you to get a much higher crit chance, but crit chance is still being restricted by accuracy. So if you want to pair that with the tome of the golden realm and get all of your crits gilding, then you might want to seriously consider keen sighted there just so that way you can ensure crits to, to keep gilding people. But I think overall keen sighted, it's pretty narrow in terms of its application, probably a C tier, like you can get good value out of it. It's probably better than Arctic to be honest, but like overall, if you want to use a lot of ranged units, then probably play a different game. Even if you're playing with Reavers and Marked and increasing accuracy that way, the auto resolve AI still doesn't really understand how to use Marked and will like shoot at stuff and then mark them for whatever reason. Uh, and so like this is, this is useful under certain circumstances and uh, pretty bad outside of those very, very particular use cases. All right, so up next we have Light Footed. This is one of these traits that was introduced alongside the Golem patch, but it's not, you do not need the uh, Empire and Ashes DLC in order to play around with it. But it's a very, very strong trait because of the way it modifies your movement. So it allows friendly units to move through each other. So here, if we have like this this halfling, he's the, the, center, the center hex, and we have a unit down here who wants to get to up here. Naturally, what it would need to do is move all the way around. It would need to move three tiles in order to get to this other side. But with light footed, you can just move straight through your own unit in order to get there. That shaves off an entire hex. And that's only if you have two units on the board, right? If you have like 18 units on the board, light footed dramatically changes the way your units can position. And that's assuming that you don't have like even other things that are going to modify your movement speed. If you've modified your movement speed because you have mounts or athletics, or if you just have like haste through your scalds or through your dragon ruler this thing becomes even better does not require like flying in order to get good value and therefore if you're taking light footed you probably don't want to be an angel eyes or demon kin as a major race transformation that's not necessarily a bad thing like you don't have to go in those directions it's just that those do give you a lot of extra flexibility when it comes to moving around the board i think the biggest thing i can lever against uh, light footed is that a the auto resolve ai doesn't really get good value out of it so it's mostly useful in the manual battles against the other players but it is really good there. I think the the really biggest ding is that if you play an, around with light footed a lot in terms of practice, and then you bring a faction that doesn't have light footed, uh, you'll probably train your brain to misidentify opportunities for movement. Um, that's mostly a skill issue that I, I experience myself. If if you're really good at at playing this game and you know, avoiding falling into your own traps, then light footed is probably a little better. But it doesn't really modify your defensive nature, which is a little issue issue because ultimately when it comes to Age of Wonders 4 you want to keep your units alive as long as possible so that way your morale doesn't collapse and this doesn't do a lot there but hey you know if you can withdraw a unit straight through your own lines back to the the back field to heal up and become reserves light footed actually does a great job on that too I think that for two trait points this is a very good very good pick and I think that you should not over uh, overlook it when it comes to this game I think it's probably a little better than defensive tactics honestly in terms of keeping units alive and and of course it's very strong when it comes to exploiting offensive uh, pressure as well just a, a really solid trait all right so up next we have nightmare mounts what do we get out of nightmare mounts these are one of my favorite mount types and it's for a couple of reasons so one we get the intimidating aura ability this thing is going to trigger off of status resistance and doesn't affect tier 5 and hero units this means that the intimidating aura value is going to gradually decrease as the game goes on but this is actually pretty impactful at the very beginning of the game if you just have like warriors or you know Dawn Defenders or whoever low tier units that have access to a, a intimidating aura, then you can actually do a lot to keep your entire 
your army alive by keeping nightmare mounts on the field because if you can just get the you know the auto resolve to the point where the ai that you're fighting against is down into low a fumble chance of 20 percent means that while you're not necessarily going to route enemies during a, a resource fight you might keep all of your other units alive and that can be really critical especially if you have evolutionary summons and that's a big part of the game so like this is very strong at the beginning and then throughout the entire game you're also going to have access to vicious killer on any of your optional mounted uh units vicious killer is ridiculous this thing is like to the point where it's banned on heroes in some multiplayer communities um it's not quite as powerful as it was in previous patches because now it only affects enemy units up to three hexes away but this is very very strong because it gives you the opportunity to not only you know get people down into low but if you can kill just a couple of units with vicious killer you can start routing big parts of your enemy's army you just need to be careful about your own positioning for that matter of course if your opponent has nightmare mounts you need to be careful about your own positioning and you want to be very very careful about cycling your enemy units out or just like suiciding them onto uh something that doesn't have vicious killer so that way you don't suffer this massive penalty but this is this is a very very solid mount type the only downside of course is that it is a meta pick if you take nightmare mounts and your opponent knows that you've taken nightmare mounts they just need to pick up a couple of things that that manipulate morale and then they're not as strong and generally you're gonna see revelry in a, a lot of builds because it is still very very powerful even in the the current build of the game mostly mostly because of scalds but it is very very powerful so that makes nightmare mounts like a little bit worse but i think overall nightmare mounts are highly competitive i would put them probably in the s tier behind athletics simply because of the the athletic ability to get around the large target exploitation problem but uh this is this is definitely one of the the best mount traits in the game and and you really can't go wrong picking it up all right so now we have overwhelm tactics overwhelm tactics unfortunately is going to compare kind of disfavorably against defensive tactics you can of course stack these things together but then you you start entering into the realm of how many times you auto resolving if you manual battle every single battle then like you can make basically anything work but when it comes to auto resolve the ai still doesn't really understand how to utilize these things particularly effectively you'll see a lot of units that would have bonuses if they would just stand next to each other kind of like wander around the field aimlessly and then shoot at things and then die um and that 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 problem kind of doesn't even get solved in a, a pvp manual battle scenario because this thing doesn't really solve indirectly what the defensive tactics things solves this makes it a little harder for people to exploit you moving around in pairs whereas this doesn't in any way shape or form now like sort of how strike is sometimes a block card in in say the spire um this critical hit chance get increasing your damage does mean that you might be able to remove enemy models and therefore reduce the damage output of those enemy units because models do impact that uh, and so it's not like it's entirely bad when it comes to the value that it produces for you and of course there are ways to modify crits like if you have more critical hit chance from uh, high morale or if you have more damage from like Tome of Revelry or if you have more crits just from like Tome of Devastation or, or whatnot then overall in tactics does get a little bit better and of course crits are are pretty useful when it comes to manipulating morale it's just that like this costs two points and requires you to have very particular control over combat and because of that in comparison to something like strong or just like the general defensive pattern of, of tough or resistant or something like that I think that overall in tactics is a little underwhelming I think that this is probably a b tier uh i think it's definitely meaningfully worse than defensive tactics in terms of implication on the game and how it actually plays out but it's probably better than keen eyed so yeah bottom of b tier sounds good to me all right so up next we have poisonous this is a really interesting one because of the implications on your early game it doesn't scale as well into the mid to late game but it does have some value even there but in the early game this thing can be really really strong depending on your start so you get plus two blight resistance melee attackers have a base 60 percent chance of of becoming poisoned and immune to becoming poisoned yourself this package means that there are some maps where this can actually outperform some of the other things that would naturally draw your attention for damage like strong because of poisoning so if you inflict poison on enemy units that are attacking you like if you have dawn defenders or anvil guards or, or warriors or whatnot that you can just like kind of put in front of the enemies to to soak up attacks they're not only dealing damage back with their retaliation they're also inflicting this stackable poisoned debuff on the enemy and this, of course, as we discussed in Hardy, kind of gets around a lot of the natural resistance damage channels and does a lot of almost pure damage. Unfortunately, dots does happen like after they act, so it's not like they're going to be uh, significantly reduced in their model count before they, they do some damage to you. But this can shave a turn or two off of combats and auto resolve, and that can save you a unit in a, a very tight situation. And of course, the blight resistance.
resistance can be useful depending on your map settings, right? If you are fighting against wildlife that are doing blight damage or plants that have a blight uh, weakness, then poisoning can become a lot better or the blight resistance can become a lot better, but it does sort of preclude the other adaptation traits. You really don't want to be taking poisonous and arctic adaptation because then you're just getting like absolutely no value out of this and you're probably not going to get as much value out of this. This is also like awful in the underground because un the undead are immune to poisoning and there are a lot of them down there, but ultimately this is a trait that I think is mostly good. You just need to be aware of the problems with it. First, we have a problem where if you're playing as a champion your free city is guaranteed to be your race type that means that they are also guaranteed to be poisonous which means that they are guaranteed to be immune to poison uh, so you're kind of taking a trait that does literally nothing in your free city fight that, that's not necessarily an issue it's just that a lot of these other things are things that you can play around and design a, an army that works better for you than it does for the enemy and that's not the case when you're playing poisonous you just kind of have to accept that your free city fight is going to be a little bit harder because neither side has something useful and then critically, it also does a really good job of fighting against alchemy, which is another potential free city fight problem, because if you have Tome of Alchemy because it's good and you're fighting against a free city that is your race type, uh, your Tome of Alchemy is going to vastly underperform versus what it would normally do. Uh, but of course, because this is good against Tome of Alchemy, there's, there's some value there. What this means in terms of like waffling and, and whatnot is that you should probably be very careful when it comes to your faction design if you're taking Poisonous, because you do not want to get zero value out of any parts of this. In comparison to just something like Resistant, Poisonous is probably worse unless you have a, a particular build. The thing that it does give you poison countering regeneration is, is cute, but unless your opponent is doing a lot of poisoning, that doesn't matter that much, and there's just so much regeneration that you can generally overwhelm poisoning anyway. So, like, it, it starts off pretty good and then generally slows down, and I think that that is descriptive of probably, like, a mid-B tier. Yeah, somewhere around there makes sense. All right, so up next we have Quick Reflexes. Quick Reflexes is just like the easiest way to flex on somebody because this is a, a pick that does borderline nothing. 25% harder to hit by ranged attacks would be good if ranged attacks were good, but they're mostly not, and the best way to use them is True Strike, which would like ignore Quick Reflexes entirely. So this thing, what, is it, what does it do? In the early game, when you're auto-resolving against enemies, you kind of want to see ranged attacks on the other side just because you know how the AI works in auto-resolves, it'll just waste those ranged units for no for absolutely nothing uh, so 25% harder doesn't really help you there and then in a manual battle against an enemy if your opponent is bringing a bunch of ranged attackers and doesn't know what's up uh, you're probably going to crunk them and the best ranged attackers obviously the the battle mages they ignore evasion entirely because they're just using their magical attacks and then they just do damage and, and crowd control to them so quick reflexes for two trait points unfortunately it's just like it's in the same bucket as a lot of these other two trait point things. In the event that the AI logic for ranged units becomes better and, and range just becomes better in, in Age of Wonders 4 across the board, we could see this thing moving up. But I think with the way that the game works right now, this is a D tier, probably around here, honestly. Like this is just, it just doesn't do anything. Like your opponents don't need to offer you the way to exploit this uh, trait. And then you've taken a two point trait that does virtually nothing in auto resolve and virtually nothing in, in uh, manual PvP. All right, so up next we have Resilient. And just as we mentioned with Hideous Stench, I think anything that modifies status resistance, whether it's positive or negative, should be something that you're paying attention to when it comes to PvP. But just as with Hideous Stench, I don't think that Resilient justifies its three point cost here, and we'll, we'll explain why. So what do we get? We get plus two status resistance and negative status effects last minus one turn with a minimum of one. So plus two status resistance is nice, like ultimately it depends on how much status resistance you have base, but like this is somewhere between 10 and 15% uh, increased chance to resist whatever things are throwing at you, assuming that whatever they're throwing at you even checks status resistance. That's the first problem with Resilient. There are a lot of things that are in the game that do not even check status resistance, and then immediately you get that, that debuff applied to you. And you're like, all right, well, fine, Walker, we get minus one turn. Well, the problem there is that a lot of the really strong things that are going to be ignored 
ignoring status resistant checks entirely only have a one turn window anyway like a lot of the cc's like frozen and stunned they only last one turn which thank goodness they only last one turn because otherwise they'd be unbelievably broken um but you can't really have this being reduced to a minimum of zero because that would also be just like outrageously busted so like this this unfortunately it has some serious problems if you know your opponent is like locked into tome of pandemonium for instance then resilient is kind of nice but the the issue there is that like your opponent is going to notice that hey you have resilient maybe i shouldn't take Tome of Pandemonium, there are ways for your opponent to adjust their build in game, whereas there's no way to adjust your traits in game to pick up Resilient in the event that you notice that your opponent is trying to go all in on statuses. So this is like a very risky meta pick that sort of doesn't have a really high upside unless your opponent isn't paying attention. And that that combined with the, the high point cost here means I don't think we can give Resilient a particularly high score. I think that really ultimately it's it's somewhere around Hideous Stench in terms of its, its application. I think both of these traits, if they only cost two, would be a lot better. But the way they stand now with three and, and with, you know, making it so you can't take some of these other things, they are very dangerous and generally should be avoided in, in PvP. All right, so up next we have Resistant. Now, we did already compare Resistant to Hardy somewhat disfavorably, but I want to highlight that you can actually take these things together because Resistant only costs two points and Hardy only costs one. So what does Resistant actually get for you? It gets you plus two Resistance. It says here that it reduces damage from magical attack, but that's not really true. What it really reduces damage from is non-physical damage. Whether or not they're trying to hit you with a, you know, a blast from an Arcanist or just an, a base melee attack from a Snow Spirit, you're still going to be checking against resistance when it comes to the elemental damage that is being pumped out. And elemental damage, although it starts relatively small on the board and then generally gets more and more important, it never is like useless in the same way some things are. Like, yeah, defense is, is really, really powerful when you're fighting against creeps that are anvil guards or whatever, but if you're trying to clear a Bronze Ancient Wonder, almost all of them are going to have something where resistance comes into effect, and then as you move up the, the up the channels and you start fighting against silvers and golds and other people, you'll see that resistance rapidly outscales defense in terms of its like real value. So I think this is actually a very powerful trait. It's just a powerful trait that kind of like starts slow and then ramps up as the game goes on. It, it's very easy to overlook because it really doesn't have any text on it, um, but I think this is a very powerful trait and one that you should seriously consider in any sort of like bigger longer pvp scenario if you're playing like a team fight and, and or like a 1v1 or whatever then tough is 100 percent better 100 percent of the time but in a longer game where you go to turn 50 or whatever then resistant is very very nice and should definitely be on your, your radar so i think resistant i think this justifies itself as an a tier whether or not it's better or worse than uh bulwark kind of depends on your build i think it's not that hard to build around bulwark and get good value out of it so i am going to place it behind there but this is highly contextual upon the build that you're you're playing with. If you're not playing with a build that can actually utilize defense mode proactively, then this is definitely better. All right, so up next we have Sharp Eyes. Now for one trait point, we get units get plus one vision range and plus one sensing range. On the surface, this sounds like it does literally nothing because it does not impact your combat at all, uh, similar to fast recuperation in that sense. But I think this is actually marginally better than fast recuperation because of its impact on your economic growth. One of the most important things when it comes to Age of Wonders 4 is not only being able to clear out your resource nodes as quickly as possible, but also finding your free city, finding infestations, and finding bronze ancient wonders. That combination of, you know, you need a lot of scouting in order to find all these things as quickly as possible means that there is actually an economic benefit to something like Sharp Eyes. It's it's generally not too difficult to start scouting those things out once you start learning how to read the fog. But overall, like being able to fog bust really quickly does pay dividends because not every single ancient wonder is actually going to appear under the fog to you. You do sometimes have to just like manually see it. And plus one vision range does help there. Now, I think the problem with Sharp Eyes is that first, as we mentioned, it does literally nothing in terms of combat. And also plus one sensing range is just like not enough. I think that if this was something like plus one vision range and plus three sensing range, it would be a lot more interesting. Um, sensing range is like whenever you see that that red circle exclamation point underneath the fog, you don't know what that is, but you, you've sensed it. You've heard that there's like an enemy army over there and maybe you should like scout around and, and stay away from them or whatever. So I, this isn't like a, a terrible, terrible pick because of the impact when it comes to your scouting. And especially on a low light uh, map, then this can actually be pretty useful it only costs one point so like you're not investing a whole lot in order to get there but it's just that like it 
as I mentioned, does not do anything in terms of real combat, and it's it's mostly just an economic pick. But it's an economic pick that costs you almost nothing, so I think this is a C tier trait. I wouldn't be ashamed to take it if, if you really, really wanted to. All right, so next we have Sneaky. So what do we get here? This has plus 25% damage on flanking attacks. If you don't read further into the tooltips, you might miss that flanking attacks deal an extra 25% damage naturally. So this takes it from plus 25 to plus 50%. And that might draw your attention if you're, you know, playing around with Distracted. That's really, I think, the best way to make good value out of Sneaky. Like, yeah, you can definitely do some phasing and stuff like that with uh, Unicorn Mounts, but you, you do not need Sneaky in order to get good value out of Unicorn Mounts. You just need to play the game and and then you'll be doing all right. But the way that this works in reality is that A, it doesn't really impact your auto resolve that much. Like occasionally you'll get a flanking attack accidentally, especially because uh, the, the AI loves to look away from the enemy army while using buffs for some reason. And then if your auto resolve just like picks up on the opportunity to do a, a flank attack, you just get a little bit of, of extra bonus there. But B, it also just doesn't use distracted particularly well. So then you kind of need to think about it from purely the PvP dimension, like in your man manual battles against other people, or if you're manual battling the, the AI, how much does this give you in comparison to something like Strong, where this is just like consistently available? If you have something where you're relying on Distracted from your Tome of Beasts, and you can only target one thing at a time to generate Distracted, you should not take Sneaky. It just doesn't do enough for you. You need something where you are not dedicating your casting points, or for that matter, your battle casting slots in order to get Distracted. So high, or for that matter, like a dragon ruler that's moved into order is generally pretty preferential if you're trying to utilize sneaky, because that is a good way to just like consistently get distracted on the board and then get a lot of extra damage out of sneaky. Because if you can flank people by just like walking straight up to their face and then punching them, 25% damage is not bad. But if you're relying on being able to literally outflank people, then sneaky just doesn't work that well in, in PvP. Even if you're deliberately trying to do that, like you're probably just going to be sacrificing material to get a little bit of extra damage damage in comparison to something like resistant or tough where you flank them, do some extra damage, but then also have the survivability to survive the retaliations or, you know, the gang ganging up that everyone is going to do on your, your flanking units. I think sneaky, if this thing cost one, it would be a lot more useful, but the way that it stands now at two, I, I just can't recommend sneaky to people. I think that broadly speaking, it's probably somewhere in the, the C tier. Like it does, it does do stuff. It's just like, not great stuff. Maybe it's marginally worse than Arcane. Yeah, somewhere around there makes sense. All right, so up next we have Strong. We've talked a little bit about Strong already, but this is actually a really good trait when it comes to increasing the damage output for most of your units. So this is plus two physical damage on all melee and physical ranged attacks. That should immediately tell you that if you want to get the most value out of your Strong, you probably want multi-hit attacks rather than single hit big damage uh, hits, because like doing two extra damage on 20 is on a percentage base a lot less than doing two extra damage on eight, but this also critically stacks up the more extra hits you get to do. So how should you really use Strong? I think Strong plays best with something like a, a ranged hero who has access to a big bow. Ranged heroes, I think, are generally a lot better than ranged units because they do have the accuracy bonus from taking the archery perk, uh, not to mention the fact that they have access to Keen Eye, which does not require you to pick up the, the Tome of Enchantment in order to get that extra range. And so if you're trying to do that and you're trying to use like a really, really powerful ranged hero, strong can be really good. But even if you're not using a powerful ranged hero, this is still a meaningful increase to your damage output and therefore sort of an indirect buff to your survivability on your units. If your units are able to hit for two extra damage on all of their own attacks, as well as all of their retaliation attacks and opportunity attacks, this thing actually does add a lot of extra strength to your early game. And even into the mid to late game, it can be useful. It's just like, this thing is definitely not as as useful on war breeds as it is on, say, your your uh, eagle riders. But broadly speaking, like this is a, a pretty reasonable pick, and I, I think if you're thinking about ways to increase your own damage output as opposed to your survivability, that you really can't do better than strong. So I think strong justifies itself as like a, a low A tier. Like it, this thing does do put in a lot of work, and unlike something like uh, overwhelm tactics, this does not require you to have very poor positioning in order to get maximum value out of it. All right, so up next we have swamp adaptation and. This one 
in big letters, do not take this unless you are role playing. Um, swamp adaptation, unfortunately, unlike Arctic and Desert, doesn't really have like a great pool of things that you can pull from in the event that you want to move into Tome of Beasts or Tome of Vigor. And more than that, it's kind of like a big penalty on your early game. Rivers are going to be spawning preferentially near you. Rivers are mostly not good in Age of Wonders 4 because they slow you down a lot. River Walk helps a little bit because it lets you move through those rivers at a, a faster pace. And then Swamp Walk helps a little bit when it comes to moving through your swamps. But you see here, swamps cost six movement points. Rivers cost six movement points. Arctic Adaptation and Desert Adaptation, and for that matter, Underground Adaptation, all of these are going to be reducing things down to five for almost all of the different movements. And that is a really big difference when it comes to your early game scouting and moving around the board. So the combination of all of these things means that like the Swamp Adaptation does have a couple of applications. You are going to be fighting on maps that have a lot of water. That means that units are going to become wet an awful lot. So they'll have a bigger weakness to lightning damage and to frost damage. So if you really want to exploit those damage channels, then Swamp Adaptation, I guess, isn't the end of the world. But like, this is just actively bad for your early game economy and does not justify a pick unless you just want to, to show off that you can win with a, a Swamp Adaptation pick. If, if that's what you want to do, then like, you know, live your best life. But if you're interested in, in building a strong faction, then you should stay away from this. This is, this is aggressively bad for your early game in a, a way that makes it very hard to keep up with the other players. So uh, Swamp Adaptation, I think this is probably even worse than Fast Recuperation. This at least like doesn't slow down your early game, whereas like this is almost, not only does it cost a trade point, it's almost bad for you if you take it. So yeah, stay away from this. Even even if you have Herbalists, which are not the best SPI in the game, but like this is just, this is super bad. Don't, don't, do not take Swamp Adaptation. All right, so up next we have Tenacious. What do we get here? So damage penalties from casualties are halved. What does that actually mean? In Age of Wonders 4, if you have a unit that has multiple models on it, as it sustains damage, those models will actually die. As they die, the damage output for your unit in question is actually going to decline, and this evades some of that penalty. Only half of it, though. And the problem here is that A, in the mid to late game, a lot of your units are only going to be single model entities, um, especially if you move into Tome of Vigor and you take up Super Growth, but like, unless you move deliberately into Tome of the Horde and pick up uh, your spawn kin, then a lot of your stuff is, is going to be single model entities by the mid to late game. So this is something that like kind of only does stuff at the very beginning of the game. Also like on the flip side of this is that the easiest way to get around damage from casualties is not just to have a single model entity, but to just go berserk. Berserk ignores literally all of the damage penalties from uh, casualties. And there are a lot of things that, that turn units berserk if that's what you're really interested in. So tenacious at two trait points, I really don't think that this justifies itself. It combos with things that aren't particularly good and doesn't make the things that are good better. Uh, and of course, this does literally nothing on your heroes themselves because the heroes are single model entities by definition, even if they have spawn kin, sort of like sneaky, where if it was one point, then we could have a more interesting conversation about it. But the way that it stands now, if if this is something that you're concerned about, just take resistant or tough instead. Like th this, that's much better than tenacious. So uh, tenacious, I, this is a D tier trade, I think in, in my book, I think it's marginally better than desert adaptation, but because this thing can actually get you some pretty meaningful economic bonuses, and this thing like does literally nothing in the mid to late game, uh, D tier makes sense to me. All right, so up next we have tough. Now, tough is one of those things that you kind of have to compare in your own mind towards things like resistant or bulwark or hardy. But fortunately, if you really want to go all in on that, you you definitely can and still get some good value here. But what are we getting specifically on tough itself? Well, we're getting plus two defense. Plus two defense is one of those things that in the early, early, early game is very important. Almost all of the things that you're going to be fighting against in the early game are going to be dealing physical damage. Some of them are my, maybe going to do a combination of physical as well as magical, but the things that are like doing pure magic damage, like support units that you're clearing on the board are things you really shouldn't be afraid of anyway. Those are great sources of free experience points early on. So I think that like tough in a vacuum in the early game is generally stronger than something like resistant. The issue with tough is that unlike resistant, which generally gets better and better and better as the game goes on, tough generally gets worse and worse and worse. Uh, another thing that of course is important when it comes to resistant is that this is going to be reducing your damage from a lot of different types of, of magic. You'll 
you'll frequently see people with multiple types of elemental enchantments on their units. And of course, if you've got plus two resistance and people are attacking you with both a source of frost damage as well as a source of uh, lightning damage, then this is actually going to come in twice on that case. Whereas there's really only one direct way to, to interact with defense, it reduces physical damage. So what this means is that this thing is very powerful in the early game, not so important in the mid to late game, but it does still have some situations where it's useful there because of the power of Materium. Materium isn't like the only powerful thing in the, the mid to late game. We are going to be revisiting the, the cultural uh, tier list sooner rather than later. Uh, I think Barbarians are, are definitely underrated in my, my previous tier list, but Materium and Industrious are still just like very, very strong in my book. Uh, and guess what's really good against Tectonic Shatter? Plus two defense. If if your opponent is casting Tectonic Shatter over and over and over again against you, it can be very terrifying and something that it can be difficult to survive against if you're not prepared. You can get around this by, by you know, limiting it to once per battle the way we were doing it in, in Winslayer's group, but overall you should be aware that defense it does get worse, but it does still have some use cases. And if your opponent is planning towards a tier five tome, unlike, you know, uh, Resilient, where if they're planning towards Pandemonium, a tier three tome, you can easily just like audible out of. If they're moving towards tier five Materium, that's the only tier five Materium that is available to them. They have to pick it anyway. So this thing does play very well against that dimension. If you know your opponent is going to be taking uh, the Tome of the Creator and, and or the like lava, Tome of Lava Burst effect, Effectively. If you know that that's coming for you, then you should definitely consider tough as an option. And even if you don't, this does play well enough in the early game that I think we can we can evaluate it uh, pretty favorably here. I think it's probably worse than resistant overall, and probably worse than than bulwark, just because as we mentioned, this is not too difficult to build around. But this is definitely an A tier trait in my book, and something that you can absolutely get good value out of. All right, next we can talk about underground adaptation, the trait that breaks my heart. So once upon a time, underground adaptation was competing with adaptable for like one of the best traits that you could pick in your mind slot because it was huge for your early game economy. It used to be that whenever you excavated stuff, you got basically a roll on the uh, the prospector table. Same with like whenever you're playing as industrious, you would get gold or production or maybe a, an extra item. But these days, whenever you use excavation, you almost always get literally nothing. You just clear the clod. Maybe you see a resource node down there and that's a, an opportunity for you to get a little bit of experience points and fighting and whatever, but you don't get that that gigantic flood of resources. It's conceivable that that was intentional because underground adaptation at one point would be really, really powerful if it came with a, an excavation that was good. But what this means is that because they directly nerfed excavation, they've also hurt the, the gameplay of just picking up excavation as a non underground adaptation. I think that combined with the fact that now the water is just like so, so, so much better that if you're looking to expand in a different direction in, in Age of Wonders 4, go to the water, don't go underground, let other people do that, let them waste their Imperium and, and like dig everything up and then you go down there and conquer it yourself. But if you're definitely, you know, hellbent on playing in the underground adaptation, you should know that the things that you're going to be fighting against are generally going to have spirit weakness. So if you can play as high or I guess feudal if that's your flavor or as an order dragon, then you have a lot of extra punch when it comes to the things you're fighting down there. Similarly, if you're fighting in the underground, you're going to see a lot of undead. So you do not want a uh, poisonous down there because they are naturally immune to poison. But the underground adaptation, because excavation is bad, is a lot worse. But the over all of this is that this is a troll pick. So the way map generation works in Age of Wonders 4 is it'll actually look at how many players are on each layer of the map when it determines how big the map should be. And so if you and your teammate in a, like a 2v2 both choose underground adaptation and the opponents don't, then the map, rather than being designed for a like a four player map, it'll be basically designed for a two player map, which means that now you can do like really hardcore rush strats. I guess that's good because it means that you have control over that, but it also means that like the single player experience has gotten just a lot worse in my opinion, because now a lot of these uh, randomly generated factions are going to have multiple traits. Underground adaptation is a lot more common these days on just generated AI uh, rulers, which means that maps are just very claustrophobic. I think if they want 
underground adaptation to just be like the rest of these where it's fine from a role-playing perspective but not disruptive triumph desperately needs to revisit its its random map generation because it's i don't think this is fun like it's a 4x and if you're playing with you know six players and three of them have underground adaptation there's no exploration you just meet the enemies immediately and i i just i don't like that it it breaks my heart because i did love this trait but now it's now it's not good outside of like a very very particular rush strategy i guess that means that it's probably somewhere in the d tier is it better or worse than desert adaptation kind of depends on your build and what you're doing but i i guess it's easier to to rush people without them noticing if you're playing underground adaptation whereas this one like kind of doesn't do anything until you get to toma vigor so down here makes sense i i wish it wasn't the case but it, this is this is where it belongs all right so now we just have two mounts left unicorn mounts and white wolf mounts but before we jump in on that if you're enjoying this video you know like this but more importantly if you and your friends are are about to play a game of age of wonders 4 and you've watched this and you've gotten good value out of it don't don't keep this to yourself share it with them like i i think you're only gonna have fun once demolishing them because you have a, a knowledge advantage if you do that too many times guess what your friends aren't gonna play with you anymore and if everyone is like kind of on the same page in regards to experience with with age of wonders 4 or at least experience with like, age of wonders 4 content i think they're gonna have a better time playing with you and, and you'll get more games out of it so share it with your friends um that said let's talk about unicorn mounts these things are still insane. So once upon a time, the phase ability here was just like ridiculously overpowered. It only required one action point remaining and would leave an action point. And so like a very consistent play pattern was just get unicorn mounts on like basically anything and then just move them all around the board, phase behind the enemy ranged units and then smack them around. Very, very disgusting with things like uh, barbarian warriors, but also just like really, really strong on knights and, and other power attackers. That remains true here with phase. It's been nerfed. I do want to be clear about this the fact that this now requires a full action and only leaves one action point is actually a dramatic dramatic change when it comes to the balance of the game and in only a healthy way but it's still not like bad this is a six movement ability that allows you to phase behind enemy lines use your power attack or your stun off of a warrior and then the rest of your units are still gonna are still gonna be able to clown around and the the best case of this is still there the barbarian warriors so if you've played with barbarians then you'll know that bar that warriors are just really really good they have that insanely powerful shield bash stun that's a great ability and does play really well with stuff like nightmare mounts because you stun somebody lock them in place and use intimidating aura but it's even better with unicorn mounts because this allows you to just apply the stun wherever you want uh and it does actually work pretty well in auto resolve because the the warriors will just like blink over stun something allow your other units to clown on the the units that aren't stunned and keep your evolutionary summons alive this is a really really big part of the game if you can use your early game stuff that you start with to keep your evolutionary summons alive and growing and then get to those tier threes before other people and then use those tier threes along with your heroes to start clearing out ancient wonders you're just gonna be so far ahead of them economically and militarily that it's not even funny and the the unicorn mounts still do what they they say on the package it's just they're not busted anymore they're just they're a little more fair they're a little more fair that's what i will say about the unicorn mounts that that said because the the phase is still very very powerful i think these guys are competitive with something like athletics whether or not they're better or worse i think is build dependent i think for something like barbarians then these remain just like the most powerful thing that you can be taking um whereas for you know something like the the feudal or mystics then you're almost certainly going to want athletics instead and i think that means that like somewhere up here in a tier or s tier makes sense for unicorn mounts and i do think that because this plays really well with the things that are strong it deserves a slot in the s tier all right so we have our final trait here white wolf mounts white wolf mounts are pretty meaningfully different from the other mounts because this is not only going to give you a passive ability it's also giving you an active ability it is balanced by the fact that a neither of these are particularly powerful and b uh especially especially Enfeebling Howl is very dangerous to give to your auto resolve. We didn't really talk about this when it came to unicorn mounts, but if you only have like one or two units with phase, as in like banshees, they have a, an amazing tendency to just phase off into the distance and die on their own. And so unicorn mounts is like useful in the sense that if your entire army has phasing, then they're way less likely to isolate themselves. Similarly, white wolf mounts have some issues when it comes to their auto resolve. So first, of course, anything that requires you to be adjacent, the AI is generally not gonna make 
good value out of, and this one only applies to melee attacks. That doesn't mean that you can't get good value out of the pack hunters, especially if you're trying to use like big power attackers. I do think that generally you'd rather have dire bear mounts over white wolf mounts, uh, even though this does do extra damage against units that aren't in defense mode, simply because like you have a limit on where your melee attackers can actually be stationed. Like unlike ranged units and you know overwhelm tactics or whatever, you can't always be able to position two units that have melee attacks together adjacent to one more enemy. You can of course get even more than that if you're like really stacking these things into the sky and like clumping all of your units up and getting gigantic extra bonuses to their melee attacks, but guess what? If you do that, your opponent is going to AoE exploit you and um you're not going to you're not going to get as much value out of this as you'd hope. So this is this is definitely sort of like a, a pair kind of thing as is defensive or overwhelm tactics. But the biggest problem with white wolf mounts is just the way that the AI uses in Feebling Howl, you cannot take White Wolf mounts if you are going to have an optional cavalry ranged or support unit, because the AI will just like take your ranged or support unit and literally run it into melee, not just like near melee, but literal melee to use the Enfeebling Howl. Now this is very strong in manual combats where you're trying to fight at a very low level. Uh, I know that I think it's Ninju and, and Amikdara have been doing a lot of fights on uh, the skirmish mod for Badok and playing around with like tier one and tier two units and there white wolf mounts can even outperform dread spider mounts in terms of their damage output simply because this is going to be dealing elemental damage whereas this is going to be dealing physical damage and this of course has a mischance and this of course does not have a mischance so enfeebling howl i think does kind of let the white wolf mount outperform dread spider mount in almost every single dimension and and critically the white wolf mount that you start with is actually a tier three whereas all the rest of these are tier twos and in case you need to you know disenchant it for extra material for your forge or if you have a dragon or whatever the white wolf mount is a tier three and that does matter a little bit in terms of your early game economy but the the ai behaviors here for this are just not very good and when it comes to the pvp aspect you're just not going to be using enfeebling howl basically ever with your white wolf mounts outside of a, an early low low skirmish and the pack hunter is just difficult to get like really great value out of so unfortunately i think white wolf mounts is probably around a b tier i think it's definitely better than the spiders as we just discussed probably a little bit better than poisonous just because it it does give you the extra movement points but overall uh, so there are better mounts that you can be picking up all right so that's it for our form traits video here on on we play games i'm going to go ahead and start updating some of the other videos for uh the golem patch and in the empire and ashes but this one i think is the the most meaningful when it comes to new content the other the other ones like all the tomes we might just literally put them all together in the same video and then just like i build the uh the tier list in the background and then just show it to you and discuss what has changed but we do need to revisit some of the other things i think that i did undervalue barbarians so we will talk about that whenever we come around to it hopefully at, at some point in the future i can have a, a nice interview with morgi who is definitely the best barbarian player if, if not one of the best players of age wonders 4 in the world so keep your eyes uh, peeled for that and thanks for for tuning in take care